This episode of Shop Talk Live is supported in part by Furniture Medic. Woodworking's your passion and you know it well. But did you know that you can turn it into a rewarding business? That's just one reason to franchise with Furniture Medic. They'll also give you what you need to get started when you join their award-winning brand that provides top-of-the-line training, support, and business guidance. From cabinet restoration and refacing to insurance claim repairs, residential services, commercial maintenance, and moving, you'll restore and repair wood of all kinds. Visit FurnitureMedicFranchise.com to get started. This is not an offering to sell franchise. Furniture Medic is a registered trademark of ServiceMaster Brands Management. Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Find Woodworking's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host, Tom McKenna, and with me this week are Mike Pekovic. Hey, guys. And Anissa Kapsalis. Hi. Hi. And behind the cameras over there are Jeff Rose and Ben Strano. Step hey. up step Hello. up to the mic. Hi, guys. Hey, uh, before we, we get started with some questions, um, since we have Anissa here, uh, for Fine Woodworking Live uh, this April, we're doing uh, something new, a student exhibition from uh, North Bennett Street School and the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, and Anissa is sort of guiding that um, effort. So I figured maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about it. It's not just new, it's new and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, North Bennett Street School and the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship both um, <clears throat> chose five to ten of their um, students, current and past, and we're putting together an exciting gallery of student work from both schools. That's it in a nutshell. That's really cool. It yeah. is really cool because I think it was something that was missing in last year's live. We didn't have no, a lot no. of... nothing was missing. Well, if there were <laughs> something missing, <laughs> the only thing I could have thought of would have been furniture. real furniture to mm-hmm. look at and walk around and yep. the makers will be there and you can talk with them Neat. about it. Awesome. That's yeah. cool because both those schools are awesome, but completely different ends of the spectrum. North yeah. Bennett being traditional period furniture and the Peter Korn school, definitely more contemporary, I would say, for the most part. Yeah. 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 And P- and Peter Korn will be there to speak uh, on behalf of the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, and Claire Fruitman will also be there representing North Bennett Street School. And that will happen, uh, that presentation will happen Friday night at our kind of welcoming ceremony, for lack of a better word, ceremony. Is it a ceremony? It's no, not really a ceremony. It is not a ceremony. It's far from a ceremony. Is there a yeah. ribbon cutting or oh. <laughs> a, a key involved? I just hope the mics work this time. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> thanks, Tom. <laughs> that wasn't your fault, was it? <laughs> All right. Well, let's get uh, let's get to the questions now. And this one, uh, the first one, comes from Damien. Um, and Damien says in episode sixty two. Raleigh Johnson said that by using the slower speed setting on his bandsaw, he could cut non-ferrous metals. That sounds like Raleigh. Uh, This got me thinking about my bandsaw speed options and forced me to realize that I haven't thought much about my selection since initially setting up my saw years ago as a neophyte. I can remember thinking at the time that the slower speed might be safer for a new user. Am I wasting time by not putting my bandsaw on the faster speed when making most cuts in wood? And what effect, if any, does the speed have on cut quality and safety? Good golly. I've never adjusted my, my bandsaw yeah. speed. <clears throat> I think the answer is yes. <laughs> or no. <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Uh, I don't cut non-ferrous metals on my bandsaw, though. So um, I think that a higher f- speed uh, for the blade is going to get you better results because if you think about it same thing with a joiner like if you want a really good cut with a joiner you go with a slow feed rate meaning you're essentially getting more cuts per inch and for a bandsaw especially if you're resawing you know how you go really slow i think mm-hmm. if your blade is going slow you're going to have to go even slower than that so i say get it up it's not like you're going to be burning the wood or anything no. from the blade going too fast and i think you're going to have a smoother cut because i think each tooth as it's moving along faster, it's going to, in essence, take a smaller bite out of the wood as it goes. And I think mm-hmm. that's probably a good thing. Yeah. It's a thing with lathes. Um, like a yeah. lot of people, when you start out with a lathe, it's like, I'm going really slow. I'm going down to 800. And when the 
the tool catches, it takes giant chunks out because of the rotation is going so slow. You're really removing a lot of stock per mm -hmm. turn, whereas you hit that thing up a little bit faster. It looks a little scarier, but I think the cuts are more predictable and you get smoother cuts that way. Oh, good. I, I Like I said, I never thought about changing my yeah. bandsaw speed before. So, Anissa, when you're like spinning a bandsaw wheel by hand, <laughs> yeah. what RPM are you getting up to? Is that like a non-ferrous metal speed? Or? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know the answer to this other than my my bandsaw has been set the way it has since I yeah. got it, and I haven't changed it. So I Googled, and um, <laughs> thank God someone Googled. <laughs> I, I guess this three thousand feet per minute speed is kind of the the go to speed for cutting wood, and the slower you go, it, the better it is for cutting metal. But there hmm. was also this. I think it was on the fine woodworking knots forum, where some guy was trying to convert his his butcher shop saw into a bandsaw for wood. Oh. So that was just funny. If you have any extra time, you might want to Google <laughs> <laughs> converting a butcher saw to a woodworking bandsaw. Now, would that be like a slower well, speed saw that you're kicking up to a higher speed? That, yes. I wonder what the speed is yeah. for meat. Did it say? It did. I didn't retain it, though. Huh. I was too busily chuckling. I don't know if a lot of bandsaws even have a capability of changing speeds. The ones that do, I think they had just two pulleys. Like what the low speed was for metal work and mm -hmm. the high speed was for woodworking. And I think a lot of woodworking dedicated bandsaws, there is no other speed. It's yeah. just on. I, I think, I mean, the only thing I change on my bandsaw is the blade. Yeah. So anyway, well, let's move on to... Uh, the next question, and this one comes from Gray, and Gray says, Last July, I began working on a two-year project in Suriname, South America. Lots of exotic wood here, but not many woodworkers. I was unable to pack my well-stocked power tool rich workshop, workshop, so I undertook the adventure, deciding to become at least familiar with hand tools. I've been focusing on boxes because they don't take much material, and there's good information and instruction available. I have not been able to figure out the best way to rip an accurate 45-degree miter cut by hand. I understand how to execute mitered corners. It's the mitered rip that has me puzzled. Typically, the cuts would be longer than 10 inches. Please advise before I import my table saw. No longer than 10 inches. No longer. Okay. Oh, no longer. I'm sorry. I should have worn my reading glasses for that one. So it's not on the ends where you're making a mitered box, but it's on the, yeah, it's the long like a, edges, the long grain. It's almost like a taper, hmm. 45. And no power tools or anything. we got just hand tools. What would you do, Anissa? Get a table saw. Okay. <laughs> and more <laughs> band saw. <laughs> I mean, it's not that long. You could just set up a jig to shoot it. Yes. We had a really cool jig for um, mitering parts really cleanly at 45 degrees. Matt Kenny edited that, and it's a style where rather than kicking up the workpiece at 45 degrees, it's got sort of an angled fence that supports the plane at 45 degrees. So that would be really good for a longer piece of stock. And I would just oh, no. start from the, the beginning with a square edge and just miter on down. Do you yeah. do something like this, Ben, for a part <clears throat> for Katie's loom? A little bit. I, I made like a sled that that referenced off the bench and kicked the plane at 45 degrees. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of the same idea, only I think I think mine, you would have to have a good solid workbench in order to reference off of. That's probably definitely for longer pieces as well. Yeah, I was yeah. doing four-foot pieces. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. I mean, another trick would be just to, what I've seen um, some guys do is mark it on the on the ends and then mark reference lines, you know, along the face and then just plain yeah, just by eye it. until you're getting close to those marks. But that's especially if it's not just a, very accurate. If it's a probably. visual thing, that's fine. Yeah. It's more that's that's probably more for like tabletop edges, yeah. but not for joinery. But I think, you know, make, making a sled would be the best thing to do, some sort of a, a tapering sled of uh, like yeah. a jig. Jiggy jig. You could you could rough it out with a draw knife or a Oh yeah, who's that? A hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> I like draw knife. That's Actually, cool. you know, I've seen Garrett on uh, when he's done some <clears throat> beveled edges on his, on, like the under bevel on a couple of his tabletop projects. I've seen him bust out the draw knife right up front. 
Yeah, or, you know, Steve Brown or Dan Faya, they'll just bust out a inch wide chisel and just hack that guy it. off. Yeah, good to see. Hi Ben. Hi Tom. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we got that one answered. Um, did I get the, the name pronunciation correct? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Well, now it's time for our all-time favorite article of all time for this week. Uh, I'm going to let Anissa go first. Oh. Yes. yes. Well. Okay. Oh, there it is. I chose well, this for one. For the listening audience. <laughs> Sorry. There it is. <laughs> this whole thing always gets me. <laughs> so I, <clears throat> I chose this article because, you know, there's that saying, those who can't do, teach. Mm -hmm. Where did that saying come from? It's so, it's so not, it's BS. It's often true, but sometimes not. Well, it's just as often not true as it is true. Okay. Okay. So is this, are we proving the rule here or disproving it? Disproving it. Okay. So what's the article? So, so what do you got? The article is by Hank Gilpin and it's Professor Fred. Is that how you pronounce his last name? And you pronounce his first name Tay, right? Tay. Yes. Yeah. Tay, Tay Fred. Yes. Ote. Ote. <laughs> so <clears throat> I chose this article because it's, Written by Hank Gilpin about um, Tay Fred, and it's done in such an amazing way. It's part humor, part he brings in the legend, he brings in, um, there's a lot of inspiring moments in this article, and... Um, and there are some harsh ones, too. There are some <laughs> harsh ones. It's, it's a really well-rounded article about Tay Fred and about Hank Gilpin's experience being taught by him and um there's some office lore about the way the manuscript came in which mm. was that it got sent in multiple postcards that's not lore it's not lore it's true i saw it but it's just it's a beautifully written article about an extremely influential teacher and written by someone who has a huge body of work to back up everything that he's saying and the the teaching moments in this article are really they're really profound have you ever met tay i never Why? did in fact um i was just talking about this the other day tay his first name is spelled t a g e so it's a it's a name most people have seen but maybe not pronounced he was actually, I think, the first contributing editor yeah. of the magazine he paul was. roman when he started it he wanted a, a he wanted a woodworking magazine just because one didn't really exist. He didn't really have the capabilities to write it from, you know, his knowledge standpoint itself. So he went out and looked for professional woodworkers and teachers and he came across Tay Frid, who I think was teaching at RISD at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. RIT. Or or RIT. Or, yeah, was it RIT? Them. Yeah, he did both. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, so like he's was the man and he had a three book set which you can still get, and I still yeah. think it's probably one of the greatest collections of information on building furniture. Like, if you want to start somewhere, that three-book set is probably a good place to start. Yeah, and legendary stories of even him being in some of the um, the meetings with Paul and some of the other beginning, um, I guess it was it, uh, uh, trying to remember, it was it, uh, John Kelsey was one of them. And so the meetings when they were concepting articles and issues, uh, Tay had very strong opinions from mm. what I hear. So, Well, they worked for us. Yeah, yeah, they did. They did. What's the story behind this poll quote? That's Con my favorite quote of all time. Which Congratulations, <laughs> you just figured out the most complicated way to hold a board. To hold a board <laughs> thirty <laughs> inches off the floor. It's, it's nestled in this in the manus in the um, the article. I just I don't remember what uh, what the specific reference was though. I don't I don't remember the specific reference either. But there are about forty oh, others yeah, like is. that in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. And it, it sounds as though he had that strong personality that you were talking about, sarcasm, a sensitivity, just a, a wealth of knowledge. And he was a character and he was committed to teaching and made beautiful furniture. 
So it's just it's just it's a funny article too. Right. But he wasn't unapproachable, from what I understand. He was very eager to engage with students, and um, so he had he had the gruff kind of exterior, but he was always welcoming to for for open to questions and things like that. So. How about you, Mike? What's your uh, favorite article of all time? For this um, week? It's uh, an article by Chris Bexford from issue 165 titled Understanding Wood Movement. And this is one of those articles where um, <clears throat> working with the magazine and knowing what goes into it and knowing what goes into these authors writing articles, basically, Chris Bexford, you get 30 years worth of woodworking knowledge behind this before it even gets going. But um, in general, I think there's an obscene amount of information packed into every single issue where really, if you bought one issue and did nothing for the next year except really read that issue and do the things in there, you would not run out of things to do. But And this article is sort of falls in, under the category of in six or eight pages, you pretty much get an education in understanding wood movement why it moves, which direction it moves, and how to build furniture in such a way that it doesn't blow apart when the wood moves back and forth. Um, I think, you know, if you're going to start somewhere on working with solid wood furniture, read this article. Yeah, it's it'll take you less time than reading Understanding Wood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a, no, it, it's really it's really good. I remember... Um, I should have read that article before I, I built this little cabinet that I had made with a drawer in it. And um, my first, I built it uh, in the winter and uh, it became only a winter cabinet because I couldn't get the drawer open in the summer. And I was afraid to like really yank on it because I thought I would pull the pull off. But, you know, all good information. And Chris, actually at Fine Wonder King Live, um, will be teaching that class kind of giving you the, the article in uh, an hour and a half oh cool well, that's so, great that'd yeah be awesome he, he actually has um he has a prop that he's bringing to that workshop too it's it's a little cabinet that he made with um a whole okay. bunch of different joinery and he's going to pull it apart and talk about it but watching that cabinet and all the different methods that are in there it's pretty cool it's just this little thing he's going to bring it and he's going to pull it apart and everybody's going to sit there and oh wow cool yeah yeah, awesome. speaking of like Tay Frid and Chris Bexford, there's a lot of what we consider to be just conventional wisdom about woodworking today. Oh, everybody knows that. It's like, yeah, no, that's stuff that I think people knew at one time and then it got lost because when people were picking up woodworking in the 60s and 70s just as individual makers, real woodworking information didn't exist and it was through Tay Frid who had the European training um, where you're basically reintroducing woodworking fundamentals. So there was a big gap, sort of the dark ages of solid wood furniture making where it wasn't happening. And um, these guys, and along with Chris and the other people, have really mm -hmm. sort of combined to create a body of knowledge that we all sort of just take for granted now. Yeah, yeah. This, this article also features the best picture of Chris Bexford trying to will the knowledge into your brain <laughs> ever. That's a. S <laughs> <laughs> I got it. It's there. That's, that's pretty. That's pretty serious, man. <laughs> well, my uh, my all time favorite article of all time for this week is uh, Michael Cullen's uh, beautiful bands on boxes, which was in issue two fifty, and I, I talked about this as a technique um, in a previous podcast, but. I didn't really relate it to the article as much as I as I uh, should have because this was an article where it just inspired me to actually do it. And there, a lot of the times, that the the things that we show, like the project wise, they're kind of big, and you know you've got to commit to it wholly. And um, with this was interesting. I had a bunch of birch logs lying around just drying in my basement and I was planning to do something with them and I didn't know what and I read this article and all of a sudden I was like now I know I have firewood that I'm going to go nuts with and it was so crystal clear the technique it was so brilliant the technique and really simple and if you have a bandsaw you know even a, a, a 
a regular, four, you know, a cast iron 14 inch saw, mm -hmm. you can do this. You know, you're still limited a little bit by the height, but um, it's such a great technique and a fun way to spend an afternoon. And really, you can build a bandsaw. You can build a couple of boxes probably in a day yeah. with <clears throat> using his technique. Um, of course, mine didn't look as spectacular as, as Michael's, but I'm getting there. Yeah. I just started one of these. Did you? Fun. Which one? The, I did the the four wall. Oh, I did the like the the teardrop or the eye the uh, eye shaped one almost. Um, a lot of fun. That's cool. And Michael Cullen, who, if you're familiar with his furniture, is incredibly creative and does often a lot of relief carving and painting on his work, and it's really stupendous. And it's really cool because he took those same sensibilities to these little boxes he makes. And yeah. I think he really just uses them as little studies to mm -hmm. try out different things. And right. Textures and, and color combos. Yeah. So you could probably get out and make one in a weekend. But at the same time, if all you ever did was make these bandsaw boxes for the rest of your career, you probably wouldn't run out of like design no. ideas. So no. it's, really, really neat. It's nonstop. It's awesome. And he presents all the techniques really in a, in a simple way. I mean, even the, the texturing, he, he's, you know, he doesn't scare you when, when he's showing you what he's doing. It's really, really nifty. So you do boxes in Nisa? I've done boxes. Are there more on the back cover there? Yes, Bands on Beauty. Oh. That's where you, you see all of the colors and the textures. Um, it's really quite uh, fetching. There's also a video workshop. That's right, video workshop, Bands on Boxes. Findwoodworking.com. Become a member. Today. Get her done. <laughs> all right, well, let's move on and uh, <clears throat> get to the next question. I'll put my glasses on this time. And this one is from Michael. And Michael says, I have a number 80 scraper. I've never been able to get it to work, even though I've read over the sharpen instructions many times, which describe a pretty standard process for sharpening a scraper. However, when I take the blade out of the handle, it's the best scraper, in, best scraper I own. I assume this is because I can hold it at a higher angle and the thick blade has no flex. What am I missing to make this scraper work the way Stanley intended it to? Use use those, Nisa. I use a scraper, but I've yeah. never used one in a handle. I have. Um, I have no idea. I have um, um, a knockoff of um, the Stanley Number Eighty. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's a German company. I can't remember the name now. Kunz. Kunz. Yeah, and uh, it works really nice. Mm -hmm. But the blade he he describes a thick blade. The blade that's in mine is not very thick. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the key there was he said that when he used it by hand, it worked well, but he, when he used it in the tool, it didn't. Yeah. And that tells me that the angle of the hook that you're putting on there is just not at the correct angle because the tool supports the blade at a specific angle. Right. And if your hook is not turned to work at that angle, it ain't going to work. So yeah. um, usually they're ground with a 45-degree angle on it. And he had mentioned using some sort of a wheel grinder to create a burr. I wouldn't create a burr. I would polish that off on a regular sharpening stone like you would um, a regular plane iron or something and then turn the hook with a burnisher. And typically you turn a really, really heavy hook on that tool. Yeah, um, right. Almost at, no, so almost at 90 degrees, almost like 45 degrees to that 45 degree yeah. edge. And it's over far enough to where it's going to work at the angle in the tool. Like that hook is going to be so far down that it's going to engage. Right. And setting it can be really tough. What I've done and what I've read and works for me is you put the blade in, set the, the scraper on a flat surface, insert the blade, push it all the way down to the flat surface and tighten it up. And there's a thumb screw on the back, right. mm -hmm. which will then flex the blade down into the cut. And that's your, yeah. your depth that, adjustment. That's the exact <laughs> way I do it. And, and I, um, the scraper I got, I had to do a lot of tuning and, and I had to flatten the bottom and, and get it polished and, um, you know, did some work on the blade too, but mm -hmm. it works like a charm and yeah. that, and being able to flex it to take a heavier or lighter cut, you know, depending, you know, for the setting is, it, you know, I like it for, for wide tabletops. Yeah. It's a heavier duty that. tool. You're not looking for that fine scraped right, finish, but right. 
the yeah. big white tabletop that might tear out, and you're going to save your thumbs from burning quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. So that's all we got. What? What was that? I've got nothing. Thank you. All right, well, let's get to the next question. This one is from Stephen, and Stephen writes, I've started planning out some basic shop jigs and fixtures, including a cross-cut sled for the table saw and a shooting board for the bench. Most plans that I find for these items have fences that are fixed, i.e. glued and screwed down. This seems daunting to me, since if I don't get it perfect during the build, they will be useless and I will have to start over. Likewise, if anything comes out of square through use, it will also become ruined. What are your opinions on making things fixed versus adjustable? I always fixed fences for, for uh, my crosscut sleds for sure. I yeah, do that for a no, crosscut sled. Yeah. You need a way to sort of adjust it for square when you're building yeah, it. Yeah, when you're building <clears> it, and then you <throat> cinch it down. Shooting boards are different no matter how right. square I get it when I glue up. It's just not square, and it has to be so precise that I took a cue from Matt Kinney's shooting board where he has a little steel pin that the fence pivots on and a star knob to where every time I use it, I'm just squared up. Yeah. That works. Yeah, well. I'll, next one I make, I will follow that advice. What do you do? I agree, um, but I also use a lot of tape if something sticks. Sure. Yeah. I mean, tape. it's just so easy. Yeah. So. Describe that to someone who doesn't know how to use tape to... Oh, well, if something's not square, just build it up with tape until you get it square. It's a shim. Uh, yeah, Boom. basically. But I also wanted to mention um, the cross-cut sled construction. On our website, there's uh, three sleds for better cross-cuts. I think Ed Pernick did it, mm -hmm. and he lists Matt Kenny's and um, Michael Fortune, maybe? Alan Turner? Maybe. There, Alan, are three, Alan Turner, there are three good ways to do a crosscut sled. Yeah. Alan Turner did a big article for us on uh, crosscut sleds. He had a really cool thing where rather than getting a big sled and gluing on two runners, he gets a piece of MDF, glues on one runner, rips one edge on the table saw, does it on the other side, and then you put your fences on and your runners. Not only are they exactly where you want them, but you can clamp them slightly together so that the inside edge of each runners are really tight against the inside edge of the miter slot. So mm -hmm. even if the runners, there's a little slop in there, it's really, really, in fact, it's too tight. You always have to like, I have to get a scraper out and kind of open it up a little bit. But um, his getting his fence square was a little bit interesting. I think he screwed down one end, but popped in Brad nails Brad. with a pneumatic nailer on the other end. and. I guess he assumed there was, and glued it and nailed it, but there was enough flex in the nail that after he, he tested it, he would just hit hit it with a hammer and he could like kind of shove it one way or the other. Yeah. I don't know. So un, until the glue set up, he had, yeah, he had, yeah, he had, he had a little had, window he had, there. He had time. Um, but it's good. And even a perfect cross-cut sled, it kind of goes out of square once in a while. Mm -hmm. And usually you do have a little slop in the crosscut sled where it takes a little English, you know, whether you're pushing the right edge forward, making yeah. the cut or left edge forward, making the cut. And then you just get out the tape later on if you have to. All right. Square fences. It's all there. Let's move on. It's time for our all time favorite tool of all time for this week. Uh, how about you, Mike first? Wire brush. There we go. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I've been making some, uh, <coughs> excuse me, tea boxes out of Wenge. And it's a really dark wood, kind of fibrous and splintery, but it's a little bit kind of dead um, if you just finish it really smooth. So I've been hitting that with a wire brush, and it really brings out this really exaggerated, texture to it and it also burnishes the surface as well it's a really cool finishing technique i've used it on white oak as well and you think that it's going to really tear it up but it really just sort of wears away the softer wood between the harder grain lines and it kind of burnishes it really well too and um, i find especially under an oil finish which needs like a really really good finish that uh, burnishing, it leaves such a hard shine to it that just a thin coat of oil 
gives the the workpiece a really nice sheen. It's pretty cool. I've seen that live. Yeah, it's cool. So you can. It's just a barbecue style wire brush, and the thing is, you can keep it in your shop. And if you need to go brush your barbecue grates, <laughs> you can use it. But then don't use that on wood anymore. So. Unless, unless you're doing that Kevin Rodell thing, that what is that, Jindasugi? Yeah, it's kind of a charred oh, brush. Yeah. You're going to blacken it anyway. Right. There you, go. you can go back and forth. Yeah. Bada well, then just bring the workpiece to the grill. Or that. Oh. Fire it up. Oh. There you go. Just saying. We have all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them good. <laughs> have you ever done that with any other woods, Mike, that kind of texture? Brushing? Yeah. Um, I think it would have to be a hardwood, and it would have to have sort of a difference in, like, growth rings. I think ash would work really well. Like a quarter sawn yeah. ash would be really cool. I think it has to be a wood like that. I know the Jindasugi, uh, Kevin Rodell likes cypress. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. cypress. And as you char it, and then I think he, what does he use, some sort of wire brush or, or wire yep. brush wheel, and it just gets away that softer mm -hmm. wood and leaves the harder rings behind for a little texture. That's really cool. It's a really nice texture. Yeah. It is. How about you, Anissa? The tool? Favorite? Can, are you putting them up? All time. You didn't send me pictures. What would I put oh, up? Oh, didn't I send you the link? <clears throat> um, right now, I'm really excited about that infinity um, zero clearance insert that I got for my table saw. It's a little bit of a splurge. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's old old news at this point. It's a zero clearance insert, but so it's an, the aluminum frame, and you can pull out these melamine inserts that are kind of dovetailed into it and just change them. The actual insert's a little bit pricey, but those disposable or replaceable mm -hmm. inserts are it's like ten bucks for two of them, and I have them set aside for different angles that I might be cutting fairly frequently and dados and it's just really nice and easy. Cool. That's my favorite right now. It and saved me we, in the we, last week a we couple reviewed, times. We reviewed those we? a while ago. And you have a saw stop. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen like the bottom of like a saw stop insert, there's so many things going on. Yeah. You have to do so many nooks and crannies to get it to fit. Bob Van Dyke wrote an article on making inserts for saw stops, which is, it works really well, but this kind of solves that problem. Yeah. How much does the the plate or the the actual insert cost, not the the insert inserts? About 80 bucks, 85 ben, bucks. Ben no, found I'm, that amusing. I know. I'm, I'm giggling because there was one time There's no giggling on podcasts. We were <laughs> we were at lunch. I think it was you you me and Mike and you like confessed. You're like just really splurged. I just bought this. And you, and, and you told us, and we we're like, yeah, that's a, if I had a saw stop, I'd buy that in a heartbeat. Like, that would be in the shipping container with the saw stop. Because, I mean, it just makes, because we have one at the shop. Yeah. And it makes, it, it makes so much sense. It does. It's, I just felt. It's pricey, but it it's is. way worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And they and it's so easy to adjust the way, it's so smart, the way they have the underside of the, the insert to adjust into the saw stop. But after splurging on the saw stop, that was like an extra splurge. But That's definitely cool. worth it. Yeah, because I was used to have one zero clearance insert for a blade and then another one for dado blades. But you'd use like a three-quarter inch blade really high, then a half inch, then a quarter. And it's just this big gaping hole <laughs> in your insert, which is doing nothing, where with these little guys, I would just get a bunch and, okay, there's my quarter inch, my half inch, my three-quarter, and just – always have a really fresh sort of uh, opening for my blades. That's really cool. Do they make those for non-saw stop? They do. They do. Hmm. The mm -hmm. insert with two, the, the plate with two inserts is $94. Well, if you knew, why did you ask me? I just looked and Tom asked you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Getting all snarky here. Well, somebody's She's got to pick up the slack. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's, there's, there's I'm, a, I'm a, nicer snarky than Matt, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, silence is going to torture me. <laughs> Many right. things torture me. <laughs> I'm just tortured. 
<laughs> tortured. Well, my speaking of torture, my all-time favorite tool of all time is um, my five-inch Porter Cable Random Orbit Sander, <laughs> and it I. Since I've started using hand tools a lot more in my work to kind of finish surfaces, a lot of the sanding I do is like lightly by hand. Um, recently, I was working on um, a little end grain trivet, and I had I, I had planned to use my uh, my low angle Lee Nielsen number one sixty four to to take it to, to plane the uh, the end grain but it was taking me a really long time and every time i would set it for a heavy shaving it would just jam up on me so um i busted out the sander and this thing conquered the end grain like i <laughs> never could have with a hand tool and so um you know with the a shop vac hooked up to it you know i had like no dust but this thing you know it's variable speed it, it's really heavy for a, for a small sander, mm -hmm. and it you know I I zip through that that face, and it's like polished at I think almost, it was almost a polished surface at 180 grit. Wow, cool. So I was like, man, I you know I should use this tool more <laughs> often. <laughs> but have you you've made end grain cutting boards? Did you have you? Did oh you yeah, plane random them or orbit. Sand them? No, no, I rented one of those floor sanders. <laughs> with um, no, but I, I was also doing a um, kind of arts and crafts display case with wide oak shelves everywhere. Sometimes oak planes really well and sometimes it just doesn't. And there was so much of it that I went to uh, down to Tools Plus and I had a five inch sander, but I bought a six inch mm. heavier duty sander, you know, sort of with a handle. It's kind of like a pistol grip handle and the big old knob on the front to really weigh that thing down. That's nice. Yeah, I wish I had a better handle on mine. That's that's the one thing that's weird about it. It's really kind of tall. Just and, top, yeah. You know, and it's pretty powerful. So if you're if you tilt it a little bit, it kind of wants to walk away on you. It's, it's quite dangerous. Careful. Yeah, almost took my eye out. <laughs> <You'll poke your> <laughs> <eye>. <laughs> so All right. You went to a college of the Redwoods, was, was like random orbit Sanders. Was that a good thing or was that frowned upon or did you do it when no one was looking or what? Did they make them out of wood? Um, there definitely was <laughs> one somewhere in the shop that you could pull out if one wanted to. Hmm. And like, nobody was looking. It had to be after hours. <laughs> <laughs> was it like a tool of shame where it's like... Um, I kind of feel as though it was. Yeah. I could be mistaken, but um, I do get sensitive about those things. I was doing something with Cherry Burl. Mm. Are they coming for you? Yes, they <laughs> just <laughs> found out. <laughs> I ended up pulling it out to finish some Cherry Burl because I just I couldn't do it by hand. It was a nightmare. Damn. So I walked that walk of shame. Cool. It's not a walk of shame. It's an awesome tool. I agree. We moving on? I guess we are. Hi, Ben. Why are you asking me? Well, you're you're <laughs> you're like you know the director, sort of you know pointing and I'm just nodding and hollering. I'm I'm agreeing is, that a, that a rotary oscillating sander is an awesome tool. I'm, I have a Bosch. Me too. And I love it. Me and too. Like I bought it because the fine woodworking article said mm -hmm. that it was the best, and I I love it. I'm sure they didn't say the Festool Brotex was the best. No, they said that the Bosch was the best. Huh. Who's this day? Every... Yeah, I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah. I think it was John White. <laughs> mm. Andy Engel? Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Bruce Back Springsteen. then, I was just a wee subscriber. All right. I didn't know the authors. Because <laughs> the Festool Ro Rotex, usually there's sort of this random orbit, but if you press down too hard, it defeats that, and you just get bad sanding scratches, and it doesn't work as efficiently, whereas... The Festool Rotex, I think you can flip a switch and that motion is actually geared in so you could really put down the pressure on it and it's still going to wow. do its thing. And I know a lot of pros who swear by that. That's the only sander they would ever own. Yeah, yeah Chris Chris Gochner was just... Yeah. yeah he, would, he said he would never have any other sander. So. What's the price point on that? $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> Give or take five bucks. And then you all right, well, let's move on to some uh, questions. Well, actually, the last one, it looks like. This one is from Graham. And Graham writes, as 
part of her booth at a craft show, my wife asked me to produce two pieces of wood that could be joined together end to end and then pulled apart for transport. I chose to do this using a sliding dovetail. I did it on the router table, but the problem I had was that on both the male and female parts, although one dovetail, dovetail cut was normal, the other side had to be a climb cut. I got away with it after some cleaning up, but the climb cuts were more exciting than I would have liked. Could I have made this joint a different way, or was it dumb to even try? Is there a photo right behind me? <clears throat> so what I don't understand, so it's a picture of two sticks coming together. It shows one with a dovetail slot the other with a sort of a dovetail tenon. I don't know if that tenon is actually attached to the other piece or if it's both pieces are slotted. I would assume it would be attached because I, oh. I think that's where the problem would come from. Huh. Well, I, looking at the photo, I, I would have been inclined to just, you know, make that, that, that tenon kind of a, a sliding piece and then route that dovetail <clears throat> all, the way, all the way through. Hmm. This way, there wouldn't be a climb cut, but yeah. Or if you just slot both pieces and have an extra long little guy yeah. and do that, that's okay. Um, the only problem with this is that it's sort of an open joint on the bottom. So as if there were any stress on this joint, I'm afraid it would flex down and maybe break no. the little walls of the dovetailed slot. Um, I don't know. Making like two short boards into a long board—that's like a really cool challenge. And there's a lot of Japanese joinery because a lot of Japanese joinery is more architectural joinery where they're doing this sort of thing. And it's like a modified scarf joint, but it's held together with a pin in the center. Do that. That'd be really cool. That's cool. Yeah. So this is okay. Or even, dowel, you know, a, 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 a non-glued dowel joint might work, although that yeah. might kind of uh, sure. bind up or get stuck. I think that's okay. I think... Um, but the operative thing here is about the climb cuts being dicey. Um, figure out a way to do it without doing a climb cut. Yeah, and a trap cut like that. Yeah, that's really I've, important. I worked myself into a corner doing um, a sliding dovetail like that, and I wound. I couldn't figure out a way to do it without it being a climb cut, and it was scary. You yeah. know, I got it done, but it was totally the not not the right thing to do. Do not try this at home, kind of stuff. I mean, wouldn't there, there is a way of doing this without climb cutting? Um, yeah, if you're using a router table and if your bit is the exact width of the key that you want, that's pretty easy. It's just a single cut. Maybe put a featherboard on there to make sure the workpiece isn't coming against the fence, go in a certain way, you're done. Um, if you have to do a slot wider than the bit, you want to do the outside, what is it? Which one? Inside wall first, move the fence back. And then you do the outside wall. In each case, the the portion of the bit rotating towards you is the portion that's making the cut. Um, and then to make the key, I would make a loose key, and I wouldn't do it on a little piece of stock. I would do a wider board yeah. and just dovetail the edge of the wider board and keep adjusting the fence until I have a really nice fit and then just rip off the key. There's my key. If you want it not loose, just glue it in one of the slots and let it be loose in the other slot. That'd be fine. The problem with that is, I, I, this, this might be a trick question, but I think that's why it's a good question. Because the, the problem with that is, if you did, if you did the female and on both, yeah, on both parts, one of those you are going to have to climb cut, because. Oh no, you're not. No. No, you're not. As long as they're the same thickness. Yeah. Yeah, because you'll have one piece oriented one way the other the opposite and if you do the two passes it's going to be uh you still have to make sure it's centered yeah but just the centering is going to be the difficult just, part but just do it yeah. it's not it's a challenge and you try to avoid having to sort of measure something to center but just do it well, you get could, there have fun with it <laughs> you could waste away the center on the table saw or with a straight bit and then go in with the dovetail bit that would help anything. I don't just has nothing to do with the climb cut, but it might just make it a little bit easier to get those cuts clean and Yeah, I mean I wasting away is really good. I think for a single pass that's good. But for yeah, as long as it wasn't full height, 
it's sort of like if you have that slot and then you try to route the inside face of that dovetail, that's kind of the wrong face you want against the bit because you don't have that outside face. There's a big gap there from your dovetail curve, I mean, your table saw curve. I wish I could see this in context. <clears throat> I think a lot of listeners yeah. probably do or did, and now they're just not paying attention anymore. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll post the picture on the show notes. Thanks. It's a great photo or picture. Looks like SketchUp. <laughs> it looks like SketchUp. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. Shop Talk Live is dependent on your questions and comments, so make sure to send them in to shoptalk at taunton.com. That's shoptalk at taunton.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. Two thumbs up. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook, and look for all of us on Instagram as well, including Anissa. Uh, thanks for listening, and have fun in the shop. Why don't we have little earbud things instead you can of... bring in your earbuds if you want to bring in your Can you do that? Yes. Can I bring a football helmet in with, like, the little ear things inside? Because quarterbacks have those to get the plays in from the sideline. Do you know where they go to the bathroom when they're on the sidelines? No. They, just, they, they hold up a towel and they just go to the bathroom. Or like, they do in their pants. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, you can't get Because you don't see them running football. off and going... Football. Any sport... Yeah. They pee in their pants. No, not baseball. Then That's what woodworkers do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gluing up. I can't go now. <laughs> We're in the middle of a big glue up. Where's that Maxwell House coffee can when you need it? <laughs> <laughs>